Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters, and uh, we, we care about energy. And first off, before I do anything else, I want to send our, our hearts and prayers out to the folks uh, impacted by the hurricane down on the Gulf Coast. Um, and, you know, when I started doing this stuff, I, I got a new appreciation for energy. And when you think about the amount of energy in a hurricane, it's hard to imagine until you see the devastation that a, a Cat 4 or a Cat 5 hurricane uh, does, like what it did to the Gulf Coast this past week. And, uh, you know, you can't fight Mother Nature when she rolls through with that stuff. And the best you can do is survive and, and turn around and start rebuilding. So they got a lot of work to do down there. And uh, if you can do anything to help them out, probably, probably ought to think about doing that. So today we got uh, a great show. I've been trying to get this gentleman on as a guest for months and months and months and months, and I've seen him do two briefings in the last, oh, six weeks or so. And um, he's definitely, uh, he's, he's just expanded his repertoire and, and gotten even more and more awesome uh, in his knowledge of uh, his trade, which is uh, making hydrogen from water and electricity. And so uh, today's guest is Mr. T Steve Szymanski. Um, his company was recently bought out, what used to be Proton on site, and now they're part of Nell uh, Hydrogen, which is, I believe, a Norwegian company. And I'll let Steve tell all about that. But hey, Steve, welcome to the show, and thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. Aloha, Stan. Hey, nice shirt, by the way. <laughs> Trying to get into the Aloha spirit. Good. Well, we'll see you here in December, but why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how you got into doing what you're doing with Nell? Sure. Um, you know, I, I like to tell people that, you know, I first started working with electrolyzers back in 1988 when I first got out of college. Um, but I was working on electrolyzers for space and defense applications. Um, you know, I was working at United Technologies, who um, did a lot of innovation in, in PEM electrolyzers. Uh, but they were focused on applications for you know, for, for NASA and, and the Navy where the electrolyzer was producing oxygen for, um, you know, basically for respiration. And, you know, it's, it's a very different, you know, kind of application space uh, that we use, that we're looking at electrolyzers for today. But the, the founders of, of Proton Onsite, you know, all came from United Technologies and their vision was to commercialize um, the technology for energy applications. In fact, our, our original, the name of our company was Proton Energy Systems, and it's still actually our registered incorporated name. But, you know, they wanted to take it out of that cost plus, um, you know, space and defense contracting, you know, uh, space and really move it into the, the commercial sector. And so that's really what we focused on since 1996 is basically commercial applications for hydrogen, uh, recognizing early on that the energy markets were a little bit off in the future. We, we focused heavily on industrial markets because, you know, hydrogen is used as a, um, a commodity gas uh, for a lot of different industrial applications. And so we were able to you know, sell electrolyzers into those markets and, and pay the bills and keep the lights on uh, while the energy markets were still kind of emerging. And, uh, but now, you know, more recently, I think people really are appreciating the fact that using hydrogen from electrolysis really can be um, a very complementary and enabling technology for renewable energy um, you know, really doing large scale, high penetration of renewable energy. And so um, our new corporate um, owners, Nell Hydrogen, you know, they had that, they shared that same vision. And last year they acquired us um, to really complement the, the work that they're doing on large scale alkaline electrolyzers as well as hydrogen fueling systems. So our, our sister companies in uh, Norway and Denmark produce, you know, very large alkaline electrolyzers. And uh, at the factory in Denmark, um, we make 
the world's you know first UL listed hydrogen fueling station equipment. Uh, so we can produce up to 300 hydrogen fueling stations a year at our facility in Denmark, and um, you know that makes it the, literally the world's largest hydrogen fueling uh, equipment uh, factory. And so between our you know the the PEM electrolyzer work we do here in Connecticut and the alkaline electrolyzers and the, and the hydrogen fueling equipment, you know, we really can offer kind of a full uh, solution for you know, energy storage and fueling applications. Yeah, I'm just curious, um, when you worked at uh, United Technologies, was that, right, was that the same place in Windsor um, that's now Doosan and U.S. Hybrid Fuel Cell? Um, that was their... Um, uh, uh, United Technologies, um, they called it UTC Power, and they did uh, stationary fuel cells using um, uh, phosphoric acid technology as well as they did the bus fuel cells. So they did PEM fuel cells for buses. Mm -hmm. And when they sold off that division, um, the high temperature fuel cells went to Doosan, and then the low temperature PEM fuel cells went to U.S. Hybrid. So those two companies are, are kind of have carried on that technology. I actually worked for the, the Hamilton Standard Division of United Technologies, where they did the electrolyzers. Um, but we, you know, we know we knew the folks in South Windsor very well. well okay, great. Well, you know, you hit on um, the the work in Norway and Denmark. <coughs> Excuse me, but um, you know, one of the things that that um, I'm always asked. It, and it ties back to your work with uh, NASA and the military, is, you know, how safe is hydrogen? And, and we always get the Hindenburg stuff and the H-bomb stuff, and I'm, I'm kind of getting numb to it. But, you know, people don't realize that hydrogen's been around, I mean, literally for at least a century, uh, well understood. But in the last 50 years, um, we, we've done a lot to make hydrogen very safe to handle, very safe to transport. Um, and like you say, we use it in space applications to make oxygen. We use it in uh, submarine applications to make oxygen. Um, same technology that you're making the hydrogen with your electrolyzer. Um, and then even the liquid hydrogen for rocket fuels and things like that. And, and the safety aspects of all those uh, different uses are, are well established, uh, well regulated, and uh, well standardized. Um, is there anything you can add to that? Because I think that's the hardest point for me to get across to some folks. Yeah, I mean, you know, the um, you know, I, I do like to point to the you know the, the Navy application because we we have a production contract for uh, not only the U.S. but also the U.K. and the French navies as well. Um, you know, basically all the nuclear navies in the world use uh, PEM electrolyzers to produce oxygen on submarines. And, you know, one of the things that I've known, um, you know, working with the Navy all these years is that, you know, they're very risk averse. I mean, they don't let you put anything on a submarine unless it's, it's really proven and it's got, you know, kind of redundancy and safety designed into it. And, um, you know, so, you know, to me, any technology that is, is kind of good enough for the Navy um, is is going to be more than robust enough for kind of consumer applications. Now, you know, in the in the in the world of um, you know vehicle you know uh, fueling, you know, th there's there's a, been a lot of uh, safety codes and standards work done on a hydrogen uh, fueling and um, uh, storage, so that you know I always tell people that the the fuel cell vehicles that we operate are safer than any gasoline vehicles that they'll ever operate. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that's, it's an important thing. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, you can get into just really technical discussions with people on it, but ultimately, um, you know, the, the, the fact that hydrogen is, is the lightest element in the universe, it disperses very rapidly, you know, as opposed to, you know, gasoline vapors are heavier than air, and they'll pool up under your vehicle. And, you know, if, if you've ever seen a, a, you know, gasoline vehicle fire, you know, they're, they're pretty terrifying. But uh, all the work that's been done with hydrogen in vehicles shows that, um, you know, the hydrogen disperses so, so rapidly that the vehicle never gets engulfed like a, a gasoline vehicle does. Yeah, we were fortunate out here. Um, Mitch Ewan from the University 
uh, sponsored a lot of training for our firefighters when the DOD was um, demonstrating hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So we had to train all the firefighters on how to respond to a, a vehicle incident if it was a hydrogen vehicle. And by the time we finished training them, they, they literally, just exactly as you said, they go, we'd rather deal with a hydrogen incident than a fuel uh, gasoline incident or even a diesel incident for that matter. Because if you have a leak, if it's not burning, we let it leak. When you're done, there's nothing to clean up and we go home. Um, if it happens to catch fire, it's a very directional fire. If there's nothing in the pass, path of that kind of blowtorch looking flame, um, we just let it burn till it's done burning. There's usually not too much damage to the rest of the car and we go home. You know, I mean, they loved it. They, they, they agreed with you that it's, it's safer than gasoline. Yeah, we, uh, we've operated our own uh, public access hydrogen fueling station here at Proton for since 2010 now. And we use it uh, for training, uh, you know, as you said, kind of uh, fire and uh, first responder type folks as well. I mean, it's an important aspect of, um, you know, kind of doing outreach on this subject is really kind of bringing those people in and showing them because, Seeing is, is understanding, and, and I think that doing training at the facility is really important. Yeah. You know, another aspect besides the safety, that's kind of the first thing people ask. The second thing is, you know, how, how long does this equipment last, and, you know, is there a lot of maintenance to it and, and things like that? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your, your electrolyzers that are working now? And, I mean, we have one at Hickam that's been running, I think, since 2008, so that's 10 years already. Um, what's what's the kind of the average life and what are some of the issues you have with your equipment to keep them maintained and running and give us an idea of that kind of operating cost factor of uh, electrolyzers, modern ones? Yeah, I mean, we, we typically say the equipment is designed for a 20 to 25 year useful life. Um, you know, certainly there is some maintenance that you have to do, but it's it's relatively minor. Um, you know, I mean, you know, the cost of maintenance kits, kits is, you know, maybe on the order of a couple thousand dollars a year or something like that. And, and typically you're talking about one day of, of uh, uh, downtime for, for preventive maintenance. The, um, yeah, the stack life is something we say it's, it's you know, about a 10-year life. So, so if you are planning on operating the system for, you know, 20 years, you should plan on a stack change out at some point kind of during the middle of the life of the equipment. Um, and as I uh, said earlier uh, before we went on the air, you know, if, you know, the, the, the number one thing to keep the stack life as long as possible is, is, is water quality. If, 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 um, if we can work with the customer to assure that the stack is always getting good water quality, then um, you, you can expect a really good stack life. Okay. Yeah, because we, we ran uh, our little, we had, you know, you're, you're well aware of Chris McWinney's Millennium Rain. They're in a little different category than you, a much, a much different end of the spectrum. But um, we just did a reverse osmosis uh, water purifier and ran it in there and and we have no problems with it at all. And he's got that going with a bunch of his equipment. So it, it's not a real high maintenance. And the other piece that I'm aware of is desiccants. If you have to uh, change desiccants out, and that's, like you said, that's just part of your periodic maintenance and it's not that expensive. Right. How about seals and on pumps and, uh, and things like that? Any kind of cooling pumps or seals that, that need to be changed that, you know, what, what's kind of the typical periodic maintenance that you do once a year or once every two years on this equipment besides, besides yeah, the water I mean, filters. Yeah, right. Yeah, a lot of it is, um, you know, basically the electrolyzer balance of plant is basically just a water and gas management system. Um, you know, the electrolyzer stack itself is where you split the water and basically you have, you know, kind of two exit ports. I mean, one port has hydrogen and water and the other one has oxygen and water. And then all your, the rest of the system really does is separate gas from water and dry it and back pressure it. And so uh, a lot of what you're doing is um, uh, you're just maintaining those, those water and gas systems. And a lot of that is, is kind of filtration and replacing polishing beds and things like that. Um, you know, pumps are, you know, these are typically centrifugal pumps. I mean, they... Uh, you know, they do have some, you know, some uh, operational life, you know, where, you know, you, you, you're going to have to replace them periodically. That's just kind of the nature of rotating equipment. 
Um, you know, so sometimes, you know, uh, a customer may want to have a spare pump available or something like that, but they're very quick to change out. Um, the other thing that's uh, true of our equipment is that, um, you know, we do multi-stack systems so that uh, you've got, um, you know, like in the equipment you have at Hickam, there's three cell stacks and then there's three rectifiers. There's a dedicated rectifier for each stack. So if, if there's an issue with one of those um, modules, let's say, the other two can continue to operate. So you, you have some kind of built-in redundancy, which is, um, which is helpful for customers because you, know, you don't lose all your hydrogen at once. You just kind of get a, a derated capacity. Okay. Well, we're coming up on a break here, Steve, and, and what I'd like to do when we come back is maybe talk about um, large-scale hydrogen production and maybe some grid applications and things. So we'll be back in 60 seconds. Aloha, I am Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green for Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3, and I have really, really exciting guests on the exciting topic of energy efficiency. Hope to see you there. Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to my lunch hour. Stan Energy Man here with Steve Szymanski from Nell, uh, a Norwegian company that um, makes electrolyzers, all sizes of electrolyzers. They make alkaline electrolyzers over in Europe and PEM, which is a proton exchange membrane electrolyzers here in the U.S. And we've been talking about uh, just some of the safety and, uh, and some of the things with, with um, the technology in general. Now what I'd like to do is kind of step it up and talk about some projects that are going on. Steve, what can you tell us about what you're doing with um, Nikola Motors? Because uh, Trevor Milton's been on my show twice now, and I'm sure the, the folks out there are pretty excited when they hear about what he's doing with his big trucks. And I know you have a relationship, uh, Nell has a relationship with him. Can you talk about that at all? Yeah, I mean, um, we have a, a supply contract with <laughs> Nikola for basically building hydrogen fueling stations uh, for their entire fleet of vehicles. Um, you know, we're building our first couple stations now. Uh, the first one's going to go in their, uh, outside their facility in Arizona where they're going to be manufacturing the trucks. And then the second one I think they've said is going somewhere in California, but I'm not quite sure where. Um, the thing about their stations is they're all going to be electrolyzer stations. You know, a lot of the hydrogen fueling stations in California uh, today are delivered hydrogen stations. So there's, there's no on-site generation of hydrogen. But, you know, the Nikola model is to produce the hydrogen on-site. Uh, they are focused on locations where land is cheap and power is cheap. And so they can do these um, uh, relatively large fueling stations for their, their truck customers. And basically what they're offering is, uh, is a lease that it's a dollar per mile lease that includes the hydrogen fuel. So they, um, in order to make the lease work, uh, they need to be able to produce the hydrogen at a low enough cost so that, you know, so that they're, they can make money on it. And uh, what we are focused on for the, the commercial stations is a, uh, an eight ton per day uh, configuration uh, where we're going to have a an alkaline electrolyzer with eight stacks. So each stack will do one metric ton per day of hydrogen. So that's that's a total of um, eight eight metric tons is eight thousand kilograms per day of hydrogen. Wow! And um, we will be uh, also providing the compression storage and dispensing equipment because that's what our our sister company in Denmark does. So it's a, it's a very large um, undertaking. I mean, we're talking about, um, you know, notionally about 448 of these stations nationwide. And, um, you know, as 
you know, having this contract enables us to build uh, a, a really state-of-the-art uh, large new factory to do electrolyzer stacks. And that is really going to enable a real step change uh, reduction in the cost of our alkaline electrolysis systems. So not only are they already the most efficient electrolyzers in the world, now we're going to be able to offer them at a cost that's really, um, you know, probably you should be able to surpass, you know, what anybody else can do just because we've got this huge volume. And that's the kind of thing that's really exciting about the, the Nicola um, partnership is that it's enabling hydrogen to become ubiquitous here in, in the United States. It's going to be everywhere. Um, they have plans to sell the hydrogen uh, for light duty customers as well. So you'll be able to pull up in your Mirai or your Clarity and fill up at one of their uh, truck stops as well. Uh, and they'll even export it if, if there's a local market for it. They'll, they'll sell the hydrogen as well. So they've got this kind of multi-dimensional uh, uh, business model. And, you know, the thing that for me is really exciting and, and kind of gratifying is the fact that, you know, we're going to be able to get the cost of hydrogen down to what we, what we call fossil parity. It's going to be uh, on a dollar per mile basis. It's going to be as good or better than diesel in, in the trucking industry. And a lot cleaner. So, and a lot cleaner. Yeah. Hey, you know that you mentioned something, and we talked about this before we came on the air. Um, a lot of the wind farms in, uh, I was surprised to find that 20% of Texas's electricity is from their wind farms. Um, a lot of those big wind farms and the big um, industrial grade and, and um, commercial um, solar and wind properties, they got a lot of tax credits and things and helped them put that equipment in. But a lot of those incentives and those uh, benefits are starting to run out. And so up until now, they've been able to sell their electricity pretty cheap. Um, but that's going to change here in the next few years. How does that impact um, doing electrolysis on the scale that Trevor's looking at with, with Nikola? Well, I, I think it's a tremendous opportunity. Um, you know, I, I have been told by you know, wind plant operators in the Panhandle of Texas that in the winter time, you know, up to 40% of the time they're under negative pricing um, because there's there's you know there's no demand for that power. Um, and you're right, you know, they've they've been able to get production tax credits that help them to still make power and, and, you know, they're still making some money. But as those production tax credits get phased out, you know, more and more they're looking at other ways to monetize that, those electrons. And so, um, you know, they are saying, you know, rather than selling it for, you know, just a, a penny or two back to the grid um, or having to actually pay for someone to take it, uh, we could offer it for hydrogen production. And having this um, demand from you know a you know this, these long haul trucks that are going to be getting on the road in 2020 um, really offers a, a tremendous opportunity to them uh, to help you know support their their wind plant uh, operations. You know, I'm I, uh, I'm not a an engineer or a scientist, but you know, I, so I use a lot of rule of thumb kind of things. Have you got a price point on electricity? where in the big scheme of things with compression and everything else, you say, if I can get power for six cents a kilowatt hour or eight cents a kilowatt hour, whatever, that I know we can make it. Is, is, do you have a kind of a rule of thumb that you use to, to kind of see if it's even feet in the ballpark for some of these things? Yeah, I mean, um, what, what people often want to compare hydrogen production cost to is, is what you can get it from an SMR plant. Right. Uh, and, and right now, a big SMR plant can produce hydrogen for about $2 a kilogram. Okay. Um, you know, we've looked at some opportunities, um, you know, where, you know, if we can get maybe power for a couple cents and we can do it at, you know, maybe like a, you know, 50 to 100 megawatt scale, we can produce hydrogen at $2 a kilogram. Wow. So, you know, you're, so it's, it's really not that far, you know, out of the realm of possibility that today, with today's cost model for electrolysis, that you can already um, make hydrogen for the same as an SMR plant. Yeah, that's, 
that's where I see this thing really starting to come together in the next year or two when we have this kind of conversion of all these factors scaling up. Um, and the, factor, the, the fact that um, Nikola Motors is putting the stations out there, um, you know, they're bringing the chicken and the egg and across the continent, how, how are you gonna get hydrogen across states that aren't ZEV states without any incentives and the states don't put it up unless somebody else steps in. And it looks like Nikola's doing it with you folks. So that's, that's awesome. The one thing that I was surprised to hear though is those trucks are at um, 700 bar on the pressure storage, is that correct? Yeah, that, that is true. I mean, you know, they have to offer a range that's as good or better than a diesel truck. So, you know, 700 bar gives them that range. Okay. So as we look at um, them expanding and the kind of the, uh, maybe some of the incentives going away and helping uh, helping give some of those wind, wind turbine guys who are um, have surplus electricity, give them some money so that we can make hydrogen. Um, you see the market really taking off in the next two years or so, or you know, what's your crystal ball? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think um, you know more and more we are seeing uh, you know not only the recognition of um, you know just the kind of the wind plant operators, but you know even utilities are really starting to step up now um, and understanding that if there are, you know, gonna, if they're going to be pushing more and more renewables onto the grid, I mean, you know, Hawaii's got a 100% RPS uh, um, mandate, California's got the same thing now, uh, and these states, as they look at, you know, trying to put more and more renewables onto their grid, they're going to need a portfolio of solutions, and hydrogen definitely is going to fit into that portfolio of energy storage solutions that's going to enable them to do, you know, 100% renewable grid. Yeah, I, th I, I see it coming. I just, you know, I, I see this thing going and I, I waver on the fact that I, I may be doing um, inside trader violations with the, with the Securities and Exchange Commission because I'm so bullish on hydrogen, but I just see it happening. I just, it's almost unavoidable that the, the right things are coming together. Uh, price of electricity, the, the curtailed power on renewables, <clears throat> the new, like you say, renewable portfolio standards that are coming out from the different states, it's all starting to come together. And, uh, and we see the, the grid piece is important too. In fact, I tell people that the grid and the transportation energy world are merging because the future of transportation is going to be electric and hydrogen and battery plug-in are both electric. It's going to happen. So you have to just watch that thing happen and it's all coming together over the next few years. So, well, Steve, I tell you what, it's been a half hour's gone by already, and I really, really thank you for being on the show today. You brought a lot of great insight to, uh, to the folks here on, on ThinkTech and here in Hawaii. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing you in December. So maybe we ought to invite a whole bunch of people out to Noha and, and tell them to call Greg Barber and get invited to this uh, conference in Kona, and they can hear you give them a, a good update uh, in December on uh, what Nell's doing and uh, what the state of uh, electrolysis is here in the world. Well, yeah, mahalo, Stan, and, and I'm looking forward to being in Hawaii in December, too, for sure. So. Okay. Well, we'll see you then. Save your Aloha shirts, and maybe we'll buy you a new one while you're here, too. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Take Aloha. care. And thanks, everyone, for tuning Aloha. in today, and uh, we'll be back here next week with Stan Energy Man. Thanks to Robert and Cindy here in the studios for making all the magic happen, connecting me to Steve over there on the East Coast, and uh, we'll see you next week. Aloha.